Welcome back, everybody. For those of you who are here on Monday for that phenomenal presentation by our coaches, challenges that they issued you guys that they dropped, the gauntlet was dropped on all of you guys to practice all week. Uh, and we're going to call this the Wheelchair Tennis Mastery Session for those of you who are checking in. That's part of our 2020 uh, Angel City Virtual Games presented by the Hartford. Right, Dana? Yep. Okay. I am your host, Jason Harnett, I'm the USTA head national coach, head coach for Team USA, uh, wheelchair. I've uh, been doing it a long time, guys, a lot longer than, well, anybody on this, uh, this show here. But uh, anyway, I am excited, as always, to be here with you. I mean, Tiffany's, Tiffany's like, hold on a second. I've been around a long time. That's true. But I'm happy to be here. Uh, before we get started, we have a few things that we got to get through. Uh, number one. Please remain on mute for the duration of the session so that everyone can hear the coaches. So when the coaches are talking, we don't want any background noise, uh, any of that stuff going on. Um, if you have any questions or comments, just write them in the chat. Uh, we can always get those questions probably at the end. We want to try and get through the presentation so we make sure we get it all in. Um, we recommend when the session begins for you guys to go to the top right-hand corner of your Zoom screen and make sure you are on active speaker view. So you can see the coaches on the bigger screen when they do their presentations. So that's important. Uh, today's session, we're going to ask all non-adaptive athlete participants to add the word supporter to their name in the Zoom box. Okay, so that's important as well. You can do this by clicking the three dots in the right-hand corner of the box, of your box, and, and selecting rename. Very simple, supporter. Uh, and again, that's for all non-adaptive athlete participants. Nextly, we are fortunate, as always, to have the medical volunteers here supervising. So if for any reason you guys don't feel good, you're overdoing it, whatever, you're outside, it's a little hot, um, you know, go ahead and, and you can uh, check in with our medical team. Uh, so just, and again, you don't have to push yourself too hard because this is really a learning. It's not really a training, so to speak, okay? Uh, the medical team does want to remind you guys to keep some water nearby or some coffee, sir. I see that. I'm sure that's coffee. Yeah, hot chocolate maybe, okay. Uh, perform skin checks before and after to make sure your skin's okay. You gotta make sure you're doing that. Uh, and make sure your name on the Zoom is the same name you use to register because we wanna make sure you're you know, coming through in the right spot, that your camera is on so we can keep uh, a safe uh, view on everybody. So please, if you have your cameras off, turn them on for us. Uh, medical's here every day, 30 minutes before and after uh, our Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday events. Uh, so if you want to stop by, you can actually send them a message and talk to them if you have any questions at all. Uh, again, if you guys have any history of cardiovascular, that's heart issues, breathing, any history of COVID for any of you guys, hopefully not, uh, any of that nasty COVID. Uh, and if you do, just message one of the medical providers. You can do that very easily, okay? Uh, if any changes in condition while, while you're training or competing outside and it's hot, make sure medical knows what's going on. Okay, very, very important. Okay. Again, please send a direct message to medical for any of you guys if you have an issue. Okay. Uh, let me see. You can message uh, either privately or you can chat. If, there's, if you need something like right away, you can send in the chat and we'll make sure that gets taken care of. Uh, finally, uh, as always, and I said that last week, and I think for some of you kids, you maybe don't have a, a, a complete appreciation, I think, for what goes into an event like this. Okay. And what makes it so... Uh, so important how these things happen, how these events happen, uh, it's really our sponsors, okay? And first of all, we'd like to thank the Hartford. Hartford is our title sponsor, fantastic. Uh, and they are the presenting sponsor uh, for the 2020 Angel City Virtual Games. That's the Hartford, huge, yes. See the bands that Dana and Caitlin are holding up. Uh, other sponsors, big thank you to Adaptive Apps, Michaelman and Robinson LLP, and my employer, the USTA, the United States Tennis Association, for helping sponsor this session today and Monday. So, if you joined us on Monday, you may recognize our three coaches here. That would be Dana Mathewson. Wave, Dana, so everybody knows who you are. There she is. Caitlin Verfirth, Wisconsin native, right on, upper Midwest, representing, and, uh, and the center part of the country representative, Casey, Wichita, <laughs> I'm trying to think of something. Casey, Wichita, Rats Lab. Uh, but again, three fabulous coaches, three fabulous tennis players. Um, 
And again, I think you guys can maybe do a quick intro of yourselves here in a moment. Uh, but now it's challenge time, okay? And then after the challenges, after the coaches review their challenge, explain what they did on Monday a little bit, um, we'll have a Q&A at the end. Uh, we'll hold all that stuff out to the end to make sure everybody's, we get through our presentations, okay? And if you have a question, use the chat. That makes it real easy for everybody, okay? Uh, all right, let's get this thing started. Coach number one, we're just going to keep it in the same order we did on Monday, Dana Mathewson. Can you introduce yourself and take it away, if you don't mind? Hey. So, hi, everyone. I'm Dana. Um, if you can hear, like, a weird sound, that's my dishwasher. I'm really sorry, but I got to have clean dishes. So, um, I'm going to be running through my challenge, but before I do that, I'll just reintroduce myself again. I think some of you already know me, so I'll keep it short. Um, I've been a member of Team USA for quite some time. I don't like saying how many years because it makes me feel really old, but it's been like at least 10 years or something. Um, I got to be a Paralympian in Rio and I got to play doubles with Caitlin, who's another coach here today and she's the best. So you'll love her challenges. Um, yeah, so I've been, I've been a Paralympian. I went to the Parapan games in Lima last year and won two medals. So that was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, I love being on Team USA. I love being here with you guys. I'm also one of the Hartford um, athletes. So this is a double exciting thing for me. So I have a challenge that involves like warming up. So does everybody have their bands with them? Cause that's super important. If you do hold it up, if you don't and you need to go get it, please go get it now. Charlie's got it. Tiffany's got it. Maylee has a cooler one. What is that? It's like blue. We'll take it. It's fine. Oh, I, like that. I want a blue one. Okay, everyone looks like they're ready. So we're gonna go through a bunch of different warm-ups, some dynamic and then static stretching, but we'll start with dynamic ones first. So I'm gonna back up so y'all can see me and I want everyone to do this together, okay? So the first one, we're gonna start with your right arm. Remember to kind of pin your elbow into your, into your side. And the only motion that you're gonna be doing is just kind of in and out. So this part doesn't move, it's just your, your arm. And we're gonna be holding one part of the band with your, with your opposite hand, pinning that side, and then just kind of moving in and out. I think I need to move my screen down so you can see me better. So we're gonna do 10 of those on each side. So we'll count out together, ready? One, two, three, four, Five. And if it feels too difficult, you can give yourself some more slack, but you don't want it to be too easy and you don't want it to be too hard. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we'll switch to the other side. Ready? One, two. Caitlin is doing excellent. If you guys want a model to look at, just look at Caitlin. She's been doing this her whole life. She's amazing. <laughs> She's amazing, Caitlin. Nine, ten. We're also gonna stretch out our wrists and our hands. So with this one, you'll hold the, hold the band down with the hand. You're not gonna be exercising. And take your wrist and from a side view, it's just gonna be up and down like this. So you're kind of keeping the band as stationary as you can and really pulling it up and then releasing it. So one, two, good job everyone. Three, you wanna make sure you're not doing this, but just moving your wrist. Four, five, Six, just like Jason's doing. Seven, eight, nine, ten. And then we can flip the band up this way and we'll be pulling down now. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Great job, everyone. Eight, nine, ten. Do the same thing for your left hand. So let's do pulling up first. Ready? One, two, Three, four, five, six. Good job. Seven, eight, nine, ten. And flip it. One, two. Sometimes this even makes you kind of tired. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. We're almost done, guys. So the next one kind of mimics that single-handed backhand that a lot of us hit. It's really good for stretching out your shoulders and your upper body. So what we're gonna do is take the left hand and like hold the band here kind of close to your other wheel. And you're gonna grab the end of the band with your right hand because that's the hand we're starting with. You're gonna twist as much as you can. 
and then pull up like this. Almost like you're kind of waving goodbye in a really theatrical way. So one, good job, Maylee, that's perfect. Three, four, five, Tiffany's got it. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Really good job. And the more rotation you can add into it, the better. So we'll do the left hand. Ready? One, two, three, four. Don't let go of the band. Five, <laughs> six. Yeah, don't let go of the band. You'll have We've some all been whipped by these things. Injuries. <laughs> Nine and 10. So that's the end of using our band for today. But I said this on the Monday session, this is something that all of you should be keeping in your tennis bags. These are stretches, the exact stretches we did today are the ones that you should be doing before you play any tennis. And before you do like all of your like mini tennis and warm ups, you should always be doing this because it makes sure that you don't get hurt. So next we're gonna do the static stretches. So we can start with stretching out our neck. So take your right hand, Put it on the left side of your head and pull your head over and we're gonna do this for a count of 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Switch and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Next, we can stretch out our arms. So make one of your arms straight, reach it across your body and get your opposite arm and kind of hold it up against you, kind of press it into your body. And if you want more of a stretch, you can turn your head the opposite way. So we're gonna hold that for a count of 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and switch. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So those are all the stretches we're gonna do today. There's lots more that you can do. You can do stretches like this. You can kind of bend over. You can do whatever you need to do, but make sure you do some form of stretching and pushing before you play tennis. So I'm gonna send it over to Caitlin now for her challenge. Well, hold right. on real quick. So Excellent job. We did have a request for some of the visually impaired uh, oh. athletes here. Yeah, just so when we describe stuff, I'm just seeing this note now. Uh, just a description as best as best you can auditorily. Try and you know really be descriptive in what you're saying as you're doing it. But I think Dana, I thought you did a pretty good job. So no no problem there. But Caitlin, for you, yeah, just try and describe it out loud as best you can. Uh, but give us an intro. Who you are again? Because I don't remember. I have no idea. Okay. Uh, all right, guys. Hi, Caitlin Verfurth here. Um, if you don't remember me, um, I was here on Monday, but um, I've been playing wheelchair tennis for a really long time, uh, basically since I was a freshman in high school. So I've been playing uh, on the tour for about 20 years almost. I am retired now. I love to coach now, and I'm, I'm loving sharing the game with others, but I'm a three-time Paralympian. I have a couple gold medals from Para Pan Am Games and a silver and a bronze. Played doubles with Dana and Rio, so that's been a highlight of my Olympic Paralympic career. Um, my challenges for you guys were, um, if you remember, if you didn't have a racket, um, you could use a frying pan or sock. I don't have those on me today. I apologize, but I do have a racket and a ball. So if you have a racket and a ball, that's I great. I have a frying pan. Yeah, Dana, can you grab one for me? And a sock. Yeah. If you have a sock or ball or any kind of ball, it could be a lacrosse ball. It could be um, bowling yeah. ball. Uh, no, maybe not. <laughs> Well, not any kind of ball. Sorry, let me, let me be a little more specific. Could be a tennis ball, a lacrosse ball, um, a bouncy ball, any kind of bouncy ball that you might get out of a vending machine at a store, something like that. Anything that bounces, that you can, a soccer ball maybe, that might be a little too big. Uh, <laughs> but my, ch my challenge was for you guys, uh, number one was to do some self-rallying forehands. So basically how that was is if you were a righty, you're going to put that right, that racket or frying pan in your right hand. Um, you're going to put the ball right on top in the middle of the strings or in the middle of your frying pan. And to start yourself rallying forehand, all you had to do is just 
turn the racket sideways so your strings start facing away and let that ball drop and then try and catch it underneath it. So let it drop, bounce, and then catch it. That would be one. And I think my goal for you guys was to get at least five in a row if you could. So just put that ball on the strings, turn it sideways, one, and then we'll go, we're all doing it together. Does everybody have their racket or frying pan? Okay, cool. All right, and then we'll go two, three, four, and five. All right, so that was my first challenge. My second challenge to everybody was, uh, I believe it was a little obstacle course of pushing between two chairs. Because remember in wheelchair tennis, we have to get used to using just kind of one hand and using our hips a little bit to get around the court because our other hand is constantly pushing with that racket. So my challenge I believe to you guys was just to hold the ball on the string and I think my time was 16 seconds. So your goal is to beat 16 seconds and you're just going around one chair and then crossing over to the other chair. And you can switch over and back to the middle. And your goal was to try and beat 16 seconds. Those were my two challenges. All right, awesome. I'm gonna pass it over to Casey. Casey, who are you? Where are you from? Hey, guys. I'm just about? making sure I'm not on mute here. <laughs> okay, so I am Casey Rasliff. Um, a little bit about me. I started playing tennis in 2011, and I am also a member of Team USA. I've been a member uh, on that team for seven or eight years now. Um, started when I was very little. Um, I've been around these guys for – my whole career pretty much especially jason um since the beginnings and lucky you gosh <laughs> too long way too long i'm not the same anymore um uh i played alongside uh dana at the uh, lima para pan am games um and i'm a silver medalist medalist in doubles there um and i'm fortunate enough to be selected to play in this year's us open I'm um, super excited for that, and I'm hopeful to, to play the Olympic Games next year to get my uh, Olympic career started. Olympic and hopefully Games, I... so the Paralympic Games. Paralympic. Come on, Casey. Paralympic, Come on, course, Casey. Yeah. Know who the you difference. are. <laughs> hey, you can try and qualify for the Olympics if you'd like to. Why yeah. not? Yeah. Hey, doubles. Get, get, get Jack Sock or something. There you go. Do some damage. Um, uh, but, yeah, but uh, – Paraly uh, Paralympics next year. I'm excited for that. Um, uh, yeah, but that's that's a little bit about me. And today, we're going to be doing mobility stuff. And if you were here last year, uh, last year, th last week, sorry. Um, Feels uh, like it's we here. did <laughs> last year. I wasn't here last year. Um, we did a handful of very important but very simple. Uh, movement drills and uh, we're only doing two today because I, those were the only two that I issued challenges on and if I can get my camera here um, we're gonna start with the hub drill now if you remember the hub drill how you set it up is you you're gonna make a square and what if you can see it what this square represents is the four different zones that you might hit a shot on a tennis court um, and I'm trying to be as descriptive as I can as possible. Um, but you're going to give yourself about 10 feet of width in the circle. And I'd say about two or three chair lengths uh, of depth. And you're going to have a single cone behind that square, give or take about five or six feet. Okay. Now what this drill uh, teaches you is it teaches you movement uh, based upon the shots that you hit on the court and recovery as well. And recovery is the most important part. So you're going to be pushing to each of these cones that you made in the square and you're going to be recovering to this uh, cone uh, about five or six feet behind the square. So this is your starting and your end point. So you're going to start here and you can start on the left or the right. It's up to you, but we're going to start the right this time. You're going to push this first cone, go around the outside, push back to the hub. This cone is called your hub. Push to the left, around the outside, back around the hub, 
And then do the inside code to the right. Always going around the outside of the cone. Around the hub. Back inside. So you're basically doing the, the back two cones first, and then you're going inside the court or inside to those two um, inner cones after you do the, the first two. And that was one rep that I did there. And my challenge for you for this drill is to do that relay in under a minute. I know that's easy for some of you people, but the catch is, is that if you touch move or knock over any of the cones you have to start over okay and your time is still running so you have to control the chair very well um, but that that there is the hub drill and we're not going to worry about backwards movement there because my challenge to you is being able to do that forwards uh, with the time because that's generally how you're going to do it and that drill is something that tennis players wheelchair tennis players are very familiar with. It's very important to learn recovery and your movement around the court. Okay, if I set this up right, you should be able to see it. Uh, I call this the shimmy drill. I don't really know what to call it. It's just a square movement drill that uh, utilizes forward and backwards movement. Um, and how are you gonna set this up? I'm obviously in my day chair. Last week I was in my tennis chair. Uh, I would like for you to do it in your tennis chair, just so you can learn these skills, you know, in the actual chair you would play in. Um, uh, but with this, this setup, you're going to have the cones, I would say about three or four inches wider than the, the wheel width of your tennis chair. Okay. And the same amount of depth as well to give you some measurements on that. And what you're going to do is you're going to sit, start in the middle of your square um, and what you're going to do is you're going to push forward and you can go we'll, we'll start right that, that'll be how we're going to do this you're going to start going out to the right so you're going to push out the front side pull back to the right going backwards in through the side cones okay and then we're going to push back out forwards and going left this time we're gonna go in through the left side cones, okay? Halfway there. Now, once you're done with those two, you're gonna pull back through the back and then forwards through the right side cones, back to the center, recenter yourself, pull back, backwards around the left cone, and then back through the side. And that is one rep right there. All, all four of those turns, that's one rep. And my challenge to you is you're going to do that three times in under a minute, 30 seconds. And again, if you touch any of the cones at any time, knock them over, slide them over, whatever, you got to start over and your time's still running. So you have to control the chair. I'll do it one more time for you. It's a little bit more complex movements. So you got your two, two cones in front of you. You're going to go out the front. And then pull back, go backwards, watch the cone, don't hit it, through the right side, recenter yourself in the middle, forwards, go back to the left, through the side, recenter yourself in the center, and then backwards to the right, around the back right cone, then through the side, and then recenter yourself again, backwards, around the left back left cone and then through the side again. Do that three times in under a minute and 30 seconds. Um, those are my two challenges. Uh, I didn't have, if you were here last week, I had a third drill, but I didn't really have a, a challenge for that one. That was just a more fun one you can do. But uh, yeah, that's it. I mean, if you have more questions about how you want to set it up later, we have a Q and A, you can ask me all the questions you want. Um, that's all I have for movement drills and the challenges. Good luck. Uh, be safe with it. Have fun. That's all for me. Thank you. Good job, Casey. Great job, guys. Coaches, outstanding as always. Expect, expect greatness from you three, and, and of course you deliver, as always.
Uh, but great job and proud of all you guys. You know, I had a great week, uh, hopefully doing these challenges and practicing. And remember, these are things that you guys can do all the time. And these are drills that these three have done as professional athletes and continue to do. So don't think like, you know, these drills are beneath you in any way. These are drills that are really core and important. So we want to make sure that you guys uh, are doing this stuff all the time. Okay, really important. Yeah, Jason, uh, can I add something? Yeah, Jason, go ahead, dude. So those movement drills that I showed you, a um, very important thing that I forgot to mention about them is that they're very flexible based around how much space you may have at home. You can make them as big or as small as you need. And it also depends on your disability level as well. Um, if you don't think that you'll be able to, to do the time with that big of a setup there, you can shrink it down. It's completely up to you. Um, it's just very focused on getting those movements and getting those, you know, chair, that chair feeling around the court and focusing on the recovery and the, the movement around the cones. That's the most important part. Um, I just wanted to add that. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Well, real quick, I'll, I'll, I'll add my own little piece. So all the things that these coaches have shown you guys, as you get better, we have things uh, in sports that we call either sets or repetitions, right? And they're kind of combined. Like, so if I, if Dana says, I want you guys to stretch in three sets of five, the first set is, is what? Five stretches, right? Three to five times. We do that three times, three sets of five. So as you get better at these things, you can continue to do three sets, but maybe five becomes eight or it becomes 10. And as Casey's saying, you know, you can, you can add and be creative uh, in any way you want. Um, so it's important that you guys take, take ownership of this stuff. Even you young kids, you can do it. Okay, but you gotta practice it. There's no, there's no way around it. You gotta make sure you're doing this stuff, okay? Uh, okay, so that's great job on the challenges, coaches. And now we're gonna get into the Q&A part. This is where you actually get to talk to the coaches. Uh, and we do have a question from, uh, from Cam in LA we're going to start with. And again, you can do it in the chat box. If you guys have a question for any of the three coaches or even myself, use the chat box so I can read it. Uh, and Camille, if you get anything offline and you want to send it my way, uh, then I'll use those as well. Um, but so Cam from Los Angeles asked the question. I'll start it out. Uh, and so you coaches can, can think about your answer. What is the favorite place that you've ever traveled to for wheelchair tennis? Um, and I'll say, you know, I've been very, very fortunate. I've done this longer, uh, I think, than any of my counterparts here on this, uh, this virtual, uh, you know, presentation here. I think I've been close to 50 countries now, which is pretty remarkable, I think. Um, but I would say one place that jumps off uh, the map for me uh, every time I think about my travels is, was Cairo, Egypt. And I thought, what a cool place to go to. Uh, I get, get to you know, visit a very different culture than I grew up in, or grew up in. Uh, got to climb down into the great, uh, the center of the Great Pyramid in Giza. I mean, who gets to do that stuff? I got to ride a camel out in front of the pyramid. I mean, it doesn't get better than that, guys. So it, it, the cool part is that, is that tennis and sports in general can take you to you know, all the corners of the earth. It's like the greatest gift of all time is the travel and the people that you meet and the cultures that you get to visit and the food and all the, the wonderful thing that the world has to offer. So for me, I'm going to say Egypt. I'm going to say that's a tough one to beat. So I'm going to go around the horn. Hmm. Dana Matthewson. Um, the coolest place that, that I really like to go to are the Asia tournaments. So like Korea, we get to go to um, a lot of different cities in South Korea for pretty much like a whole month when you play the different tournaments there, which I really love. And Japan too. I feel like, um, although like we get to go to Europe and, and a lot of other places like that, which is amazing. I feel like for some reason, when you get to go to Asia, you really feel like you are somewhere else. Like nobody really speaks English. Like all the signs are obviously in a very different language. Like everything just feels very far away from home. And for me, that really makes it feel like a really cool experience. So I really like being there. I think the culture is really cool. Um, yeah, like, like Jason said, tennis is one of the few sports that allows you to really travel all over the world, like all the time. It's a really cool job to have. Um, a lot of times I'll be on a tennis court and I'll look around and kind of pinch myself like, wow, I'm playing tennis in South Africa today, or I'm playing tennis in Europe today. And that, that's really cool. That's not something that everybody gets to do for their job. So the fact that we get to do that's awesome. 
and Dana. That's awesome. And you're right. It's just uh, it's such a tennis is different that way than most sports. We have a chance to to see the world, so it's awesome. Thank you, Dana. Caitlin, what do you think? I'm with Dana. I love Japan. I love going to Japan. But my second one was, um, I was going to say Athens, Greece. So I got to go to the Paralympics there in 2004. I know it was a really long time ago. And But what was so cool about it is I love Mediterranean food. So that to me was like the best part. The second thing was we got there early enough to train and stuff, but we also had time to go to the Acropolis and to really see where like Aristotle is and oh, my computer, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> where to see, uh, to see where um, all the plays were done and things like that. They even put in like a makeshift elevator to help us get up there uh, for the Paralympics, which was really cool. Scary. Um, that but, was really scary, that elevator. Yeah, it was also pretty scary because you were just like, uh, you were just kind of like hanging. In the, it felt really oh, weird, but awesome. it was really a really cool experience. And being my first Paralympic Games, it's also where the Olympics started. Um, so I really felt like I got to be a, you know, got to kind of experience a big part of history and um, really be there for all that. So I would say Athens is, is my, one of my favorite places. A good choice. The place is amazing. Thank you, Kaylin. Rats left. Casey. All right. So I, I actually have a very solidified answer for this because I think about this all the time. Um, and it would actually have to be my last year, my last World Team Cup in juniors in Tokyo, Japan. Um, that, that was my favorite, not only location, but the, the tournament itself. Like tennis-wise, the memories are just great. Um, so we, we actually won uh, the Junior World Team Cup uh, tournament there um my last year of juniors and that was the second year in a row that we won and um but to, i mean tokyo itself and i i had played a, a tournament before that in another neighboring uh japanese city uh before world team cup and just my my whole stint in japan was so enjoyable um i love the culture over there the people are so nice tokyo is like it's such a unique city and i i remember my family like my whole family was there as well to get to watch me play. And that's like never happened before up to, up to that point. And um, I just have a lot of good memories tied to that, that city. And um, obviously I have the, the Paralympics to, to look forward to They're in Tokyo. So that's extremely exciting. That adds to everything, but I'm, I'm so excited to go back to Tokyo. Um, yeah, it was great. I mean, that's, that's the one, the one place where I'm like, yeah, that was, that was like my favorite, favorite tennis memory and favorite place I've, I've been to. But a close second, um, and this is like my unique answer, would have to be Israel, uh, World Team Cup last year. I really enjoyed Israel. It's a very historical place, very old, um, very beautiful too. It's, it's like tropical there. It's, you feel like you're in Miami almost. Um, it's, it was an, an, an amazing experience too. Um, I had a great time with my team and uh, everyone, everyone else. And it was, it was awesome. So those are my two answers. Those are great choices right there. Phenomenal yeah. places. Yeah. We hope to go back to those places. They're just special, special places. So thank you for that case. All right. We'll go to the next question. We got a question from Dennis Jordan, sir. Thank you. I see that he's, he's looking intently. He's like, I want to know what is, and we'll start with you, Dana. What's your favorite type of tennis court? Hard court by far. I do not like clay at all. Grass. grass is fun. Grass is fun. It's not as hard to push on grass as I thought it was going to be, although it does depend on where you're playing it at. Same with clay. You know, some clay courts are really nice to, to move on. Some of them, it feels like you're in some sort of like wet sand pit. So it really depends. So I love a hard court. It's easiest to push on. I think that the way that I like to play tennis really suits itself more to like a hard court setting. I just really don't like that clay gets everywhere. And then you find it for months and months and months on all of your stuff. Your shoes are ruined, your chairs. Are... I could go on. I really don't like it. But I think, I think other people like it. I just don't. <laughs> well, Faith, for, for those of you, that's, a, that's the right answer, by the way. Hard court's the way to go, guys. Yeah. But, but, it, but really, for you guys who are new to tennis, there are lots of surfaces in tennis. All right, we have the Grand Slams, which some of you may have heard of. We got the U.S. Open coming up that Dana and, and Casey are going to be attending and playing in, which are on a hard court. 
Then we have the Australian Open in January, which is also on a hard court. Uh, then the French Open comes up in June, May, June, which is a red clay, right? Which is a little bit of softer clay. And there's also something called Har True, which is a green clay, which is more common in the United States, especially here in Florida, in the South. Um, and that plays differently than the red clay. And then we also have the grass courts of Wimbledon and that there's a whole season for grass courts. Uh, but there's also rubber courts for indoor courts. Uh, there's uh, something called OmniTurf, which is like an artificial grass with sand on it. And there's all sorts of, of surfaces that are used in the sport, which also makes tennis very cool, very challenging. There's if, if you're playing great, but we put you on a surface you're not so happy on, it becomes a huge challenge for you. So that's where tennis is really, really cool. So uh, let's go on next. Caitlin, favorite surface? Oh, um. I, I love hard court, but um, I really hate that that grassy, uh, sandy court. That's awful. It's my least favorite. But I do actually really like clay. I love going to Europe, and I really love playing on the red clay because I like to get down and dirty. I'm more of a grinder type player. I like to I like to get into the points. Um, and I also like that clay is a little bit more of an equalizer. So like if you're playing somebody that you know hits the ball really hard and flat it bounces a little bit differently. So it doesn't come at you as hard, but I don't think. And so I feel like it kind of slows it down a little bit and you're able to set up and maybe hit a little bit, a, big, a bigger shot that you wouldn't be able to hit on a, on a hard court. So um, I really, I really like clay, um, but I love playing on the red clay in Europe. I, I don't really like playing clay tournaments here in the States because I don't really like the green clay for some reason. Um, I prefer the red cause you can really slip and slide. And um, so that would be my favorite uh, under hard court. Casey. Awesome. Hey, real quick, Case, before you jump in, it's also yeah. important to note, as, as Dana pointed out as well, uh, you know, pushing is different on every surface, right? The hard courts are going to be the easiest because it's flat uh, and then the ball bounce is true, right? Because if you get on dirt on clay, sometimes the ball is slower. It, it may hit, hits a little rock and bounces to the right or to the left. That can happen. But clay is also a little bit tougher to push on. You know, and Caitlin loves that grind, but clay can play differently. If it's a little wet, a little dry, plays different. Grass is extremely difficult to push on, but you can get used to it. But it is very different than the other surfaces. So it's cool that the surfaces not only push differently, but the ball bounce. The ball bounce on grass tends to be the first bounce is going to be probably okay. Second bounce is definitely going to be lower, right, if you're taking that second bounce. So that makes the pushing on the grass very, very challenging just a different style of game you have to play so it's kind of cool Casey what do you think yeah so my answer is actually I'm unmuted right yeah okay my answer is actually very uh similar to Caitlin's um so I I, I pretty much live on hard court uh here in the midwest and it, it's gotta be my favorite I feel like it's just like the standard way of playing tennis it's on hard court um it's just how tennis should be. Um, but at the same time, I love playing on, on clay courts. It's just the nitty grittiness of it. Um, I consider myself to be a more physical player. Um, so I love to, to grind and, and, and push through that clay and just have long points and you get dirty as well. It's just something, something I love about it. Um, and yeah, it, it is a mess though. You do have clay like on your chair for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I don't know. I, I have good results on clay too. I just, I really enjoy playing clay. It's just a very, it, it's all, it's almost more, pr a more primal way of playing tennis. It's just, just pounding it. You know, it's, it's awesome. I love it. Okay, um, but clay, the hard, hard court is probably takes it for me. And I've never played on grass before, but hopefully one day. Yeah. One day. Great answers guys. Great answers. Thank you, David, for that question. It's a good one. Tiffany asks, have you guys been training in quarantine? Good question. Dana? Uh, well, in the beginning of quarantine, when we were all in lockdown, we had to pretty much limit ourselves to doing tennis indoors, which is not the easiest thing. It's not like basketball where we can kind of like set up a hoop and then kind of like work on our shots because you can't really bring a tennis court inside. But um, actually, I guess that's wrong because when I lived with when I lived with Mackenzie, who's another member of Team USA, we built like a mini tennis court in our living room and we were kind of like playing around with mini tennis there. So that was actually really fun. 
Um, so you just kind of had to get creative, which is what we did, but you do a lot of different like home workouts. Um, we're lucky enough with the USTA staff that they designed some workouts for us to do at home. And so Mackenzie and I um, were doing that a lot during the time where we couldn't really like leave our house. Um, lucky enough, like tennis is one of those socially distant sports. So we're able to go back to training now. So I've been able to go and play on a real tennis court now for about maybe like a month and a half, two months. So luckily we're not really training at home, but it is something that it was difficult, but I think it really kind of taught us all to be really innovative. Great answer. Perfect. Caitlin? Well, I have, since Rio, I pretty much retired from playing wheelchair tennis, and I'm trying a new sport called paracanoe. So if you look behind me, I have this huge boat, and um, thankfully, paracanoe is on the water. So um, I was on the water almost every day during quarantine. Um, Greg, my partner, was helping me a lot get out there. So uh, I also have an ergometer, which is something that um, you can paddle, and it's just like a stationary kind of bike. Um, but I, I've been paddling on that as well. So, um, but I do teach tennis, and since quarantine, I had to get a little bit more creative. Um, I had been using Zoom platform to help some of the kids that I teach in the schools, um, just working on our up taps and down taps, self rallying, and all that kind of stuff. So I had to get a little innovative. But um, tennis is great because if you have a wall, you can always hit against a wall. Um, if you have a partner, a brother, or sister, you can work on some ball eye-hand coordination skills. So um, just got a little innovative with that, but you can always work with the ball and, and some kind of, uh, and if you have a racket, but um, yeah, that's kind of what I did. Lucky being on the water. I love that. Awesome. Kate, what about you? Yeah, so my my uh, training situation kind of went through a lot of phases throughout quarantine. Um, obviously, initially, when everything locked down, um, I wasn't very active at all. Um, it was very difficult to find really anywhere that was open and available to us just because everything was shutting down. Um, I remember very early on, uh, we started playing on uh, just like local high school courts that we would find. Um, and me and my my coaching crew here would would look around for coaches and but then those shut down the school shut down nobody was allowed on school grounds and we would just basically search around for uh open open parks that had courts there and uh luckily there was one very near where i live and uh we would train there every day for for months um just in a local county park and um so that uh, that was my situation uh, most of quarantine, I would say. And what, what makes my situation a little bit more unique is that where I train primarily is on a university. And we weren't allowed to go, we weren't allowed to be on university grounds uh, for the longest time. And uh, that, that opened back up probably a, a month, maybe less, um, but not that long ago. And uh, that's where I've been training now is, is at the university where I go to, and that's uh, where I train full time. But um, for a while, it was, it was difficult. Um, it was a lot of uh, trying to stay fit indoors and doing what I can with, you know, kind of the stuff we were doing now and, you know, hitting off walls and um, trying to stay fit, doing home workouts and stuff, um, just getting innovative with it. Um, but it, it was difficult, but uh, Fortunately, I got some really, go uh, really good time uh, on court uh, once things started to open back up again. Um, and it was, it, it's for fortunately enough, um, there are plenty of courts that are public and you can go to, uh, whether it's in, you know, a, a public park or neighborhoods or, you know, whatever. If you, if, if you look, you can always find something, I think, but um but you can always do, you know, stuff at home, you know, kind of like the stuff that we're doing on, on, on these meetings, but uh, it was interesting. It was very interesting, but it, it was good. It ended up being, being fine. So. Yeah. Great answer. Cause I think we've all learned how to become more innovative and more creative in everything we're doing. And obviously so much of our, our lives right now is virtual. You have to learn how to be independent and do things at home and, and, and figure out how to do that stuff. So yeah, great answer yeah. case. Thank you. And Tiffany, great question. Thank you for that. Um, quick question from Camille. What are the 
uh, and Shelly, what are the courts like at the Paralympic Games? Um, let me see. You know, I mean, every Paralympic Games technically could be different. Um, but for wheelchair tennis, every Paralympic game so far has been on a hard court. Um, and Tokyo will be no different. Um, Casey alluded to, we had World Team Cup uh, back in 2016 in Tokyo, uh, actually at the same exact site that the Paralympic Games will be held at. Uh, and it's a beautiful tennis center, and it was a hard court. And it will be a hard court again next year when we go. Um, but... Uh, yeah, hard court. It's, I think it's just easy maintenance, easy to, to make sure it's consistent, um, and I think the players enjoy it the most. So, uh, good. Uh, so, thank you for those questions, Camille and Shelly. Um, Tina, what made you choose tennis over other sports? I mean, because as we talked about, as Dana mentioned before, you know, she grew up and had gone to some sport camps, and, you know, adaptive sport camps tend to give you quite a few options to try out whether it's track or swimming or tennis or basketball or, you know, all sorts of stuff you can try, but ultimately why was it tennis? So Dana, why don't you go first? Unmute, I'm, on mute. I'm not on mute anymore. So let's see. I, well, I grew up as a soccer player and I had even tried tennis um, a couple times. This is all prior to my injury and I just didn't like it. So it's very surprising that I ended up liking tennis now. Um, I think that after I went to that camp when I was a kid and I, and I met the other kids that were there and, and tried it out, I met Jason at that camp. Um, it, it just kind of clicked. I know that that's not like the, the cool, super insightful answer that, that would make it sound amazing. But for some reason, like tennis just really clicked for me. I think that prior to playing tennis, I never really had a sport where I played by myself. Like, you know, soccer is a team sport and I love that. And I still really love that, which I think is why I love doubles so much. Um, so again, I guess that's another reason to like tennis. You can have a team sport and you can have a singular sport because in wheelchair tennis, we don't specialize. We do both at all the tournaments we go to. But I think I like that in tennis, you have to learn to rely on yourself. And after my injury, tennis really taught me how to be independent again. It allowed me the chance to travel the world. It allowed me to kind of like stand on my own two feet, so to speak and um, be kind of self-reliant more or less, which I think you don't get to the same extent with other sports where you're on a team. Um, it does come, but maybe in a different way. And so I think tennis really like came into my life at a time when I really needed it the most and I just really clicked with it and I stuck with it. Great question. Great answer. I love it. I love it. All right, Caitlin, your turn. All right, so I started playing tennis Really, I broke my back when I was seven in a car accident. And before that, I played soccer and did ballet. And my main thing, though, was, like, I started playing wheelchair basketball. And I thought that was really fun, and I loved it. But I wanted to play wheelchair basketball all the time. And what that meant for me was I had to find, like, you know, five other people, you know, or ten other people in wheelchairs to be able to go to a court and, like, play or three on three. And so what I realized that why I started playing tennis is I just, the cool thing about wheelchair tennis is that it's inclusive. So I actually really started playing on my high school tennis team. And the only rule difference is the wheelchair player is allowed two bounces. But honestly, I just want to be able to go out and like compete and play a sport with my friends. And just because I'm in a wheelchair, it was an equally level playing field with the two bounce rule. And so not, it wasn't until like after my first or second year at high school playing, playing tennis on my high school team did I like learn about the tour and that there's a whole wheelchair tennis tour and like then I think I went to my finally my first tournament and I met Jason and maybe Dan James at that time and um, that's when I learned about wheelchair tennis and then I realized like wow you can go and play all over the world and and the other thing that kind of drew me in was if you're good enough and if you can win, you can make some prize money. So you can, so you can make some money in the sport. Whereas like in wheelchair basketball, there's, there's no money. If you go and play in the canoe in the kayak and canoe, like if I win, I don't, I don't get any money. Um, but that's the cool part about tennis is, is number one, it's inclusive. You can play with your family and friends. You can play on a USTA league. Um, you're just allowed two bounces. And, and secondly, if you want to be pro or, or go big, you can, you can make a little money and it gives you a little incentive to work harder. So um, that's, my, that's why I chose tennis. Awesome. All great reasons, both you two. Excellent. All right, Casey, 
your answer. Okay, so so my story with with tennis and how I fell in love with it is is a little unique in that, like even even when I was just beginning, I was exposed to a lot of great people and great resources, and and why that is is because so I I wanted to play sports growing up. I I grew up in an athletic family; they all played sports. And I wanted to be a part of something, whether it was a team sport or whatever. And I remember begging to my parents to, to look for something, to find something. And I started with track and field, um, and that was fun. Um, and I, I even uh, skied a little bit before, before that as well, both water skiing and snow skiing. And that was really enjoyable as well. Um, but it was really difficult to do because living in Kansas, there's not very many mountains. Um, and, and lakes aren't exactly very close either. And you need a boat and all this and that. And, but I mean, we looked around and eventually, um, I stumbled across, across this adaptive sports clinic that, that I went to at, at one of our local, local schools here. And, um, we found wheelchair tennis and the man who was running the, the wheelchair tennis ex exhibit was none other than Nick, Nick Taylor. So. Um, from a very early age, I was exposed to uh, a very high level of tennis um, and very high level coaching because Nick Taylor is a multiple time gold medalist. Um, he's been playing since the dawn of time. Um, he's an amazing athlete and he's the one who got me started. And uh, he got actually got me uh, linked up with a guy that uh, used to coach him back, back when he was younger. And um, I started taking lessons pretty much immediately after I got into it. And going back to what Dana said, um, it's kind of a cliche answer, but when I, when I first did the exhibit, I got in the chair, I was given a racket, and the first ball I hit over, it was just like, man, this feels amazing. It just clicked immediately. And um, that obviously sparked a fire, but, but what really – what really carried my, my love for tennis and my career in tennis along was my support system around me and, and the resources that I had and the great minds that I had coaching me from very early on. Um, so that's why I think it was kind of a unique experience because not a lot of people have that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of my story on how I got into wheelchair tennis and, uh, going back to Nick, he's, he's also a big reason why I'm still, playing and I'm at the level that I am today because he's given me so much so, so many opportunities and he's a very inspiring athlete and uh, if you know anything about him he he pushes me pretty hard so yeah uh, that's kind of my story awesome yeah. Nick Taylor legend uh, but clearly a mentor to you which I think yep. is awesome I mean, yep. you know, think the great thing in life is to have good mentors good people around you guiding you I think we have time. Thank you, Casey. And thank you, ladies. I think we have time for one more question. We'll try and get through it quickly. This is from now. Um, what's your favorite or most impactful coaching moment, either as an athlete or as a coach? So I know you guys have coached in camps and done some coaching, you know, for you guys, what have been, the, have been coached? Was there like a breakthrough moment for you guys? Uh, see if we can get through that. Dana, you go ahead and start. Um, let's see. I, I really have like a soft spot for multi-sport camps, very much like the one that, that we're hosting today. Um, the very first time that I ever saw adaptive sports was at a multi-sport camp and that was down in San Diego. And so for me to have attended a bunch of camps like that and then to later be asked to help with like the USTA's junior camps later on as a coach was always really cool for me. I think um, it's always really important to give back, especially in, in the world like ours, where it's a little bit kind of small and it's only gonna grow when people like us that have maybe like come through these camps to give back and to help things grow like that. So for me to be able to kind of be on the other side of it and teach tennis to a kid um, that's very much in the same position that I was years ago is really heartwarming to me and I really love it. And you know, there would be times where there would be young girls who are like, I wanna be like, you know, I wanna have the same racket as Dana or things like that. And those are things that, you know, really kind of like make you pinch yourself. Like, wow, I'm really a role model to someone and someone really looks up to me and that's a big honor. And that's something that, that I take really seriously and, and really kind of continues me to wanna 
you know, inspire others the same way that I was inspired. So I don't think I have one specific moment, but anytime that I get to give back and do things like this or coach any sort of camps is like my favorite thing. Awesome answer. Perfect. Caitlin. I would, I, I have to, I, I feel so lucky every day. I, I am really only teaching tennis right now. So every day I feel so lucky to be able to share the sport with others. And, you know, as soon as I can teach someone how to hit that forehand perfectly or that backhand that, that we've been working on for so long, I just get so excited inside. Like, it's an amazing feeling for me to be able to share the sport with others and just being able to get on a court every day with somebody and be able to teach them how to hit a forehand properly or how to hit a backhand properly. Um, that really makes me smile and it makes me excited about tennis again, every time it's like a whole new, like feeling over again. And then as they go out and then we're able to hit and now we can rally and they're doing it right. Like, ah, oh, that makes me so happy. So there's a lot of times and moments like that. I know last year, um, during the, the Angel City games, I was working with a bunch of little boys over there and they were totally getting it and hitting the ball over the net. And to me, I mean, those are some of my most favorite memories of, of being able to get back and uh, like having coaching moments on the court. So that's what I got. Your energy is awesome, Kayla. I feel like you're ready to come out of retirement and start training again. I know. This is the announcement. She's moving to Orlando. And she's coming to train at the national campus. <laughs> I'm just kidding, kid. You happy? All right. What about you, Casey? Well, I think I've been thinking about this. Um, I think that the the most important memories that I have when it comes to how I was affected as a player and as a coach, uh, cause I have a little bit of coaching experience uh, as well. Um, I have a, a group of kids that I coach here uh, every summer and um, I've done some coaching for middle schools as well. Um, and some of my most impactful memories that have both helped me as a player and as, you know, as witnessing how coaching wheelchair tennis can be is the junior camps in uh, Mission Viejo. Um, I can't remember how many years I, I, I attended those camps. I can't even remember the last year I was there. I don't know if you can help me out or not, but. Um, uh, you know, it's been, you, you probably attended maybe four or five of those actually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it was a handful of times, but though those camps were the first time I was really exposed to like high level wheelchair tennis coaching via the national coaches like yourself, Jason, and a handful of others. And uh, seeing that, and I also got to learn, or I got to get to know the, my, my, some of my fellow teammates that would grow up alongside me and push me in my tennis career um, through juniors and, and through men's and really through all the levels of tennis. And that really helped push me to become who I am on the tennis court. And just the, it exposed me to, to that, you know, level of tennis. And like at, at that point, when I, when I started going to those camps, I didn't really know the extent of what it could be. And like, I'd never really met that many people who, you know, were interested in the same like sport, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but th those were really important years for me and, uh, and getting to know all those people and, uh, learning about all their their backgrounds with with athletics and um, getting into wheelchair tennis and that's where I, I got to know my you know longtime friends um, who are still national coaches such as Jason and um, those were just very raw and important years in my life uh, growing up and they really shaped who I am today. Phenomenal. And I'll say on my own, uh, the junior camps, like he's talking about, camps like this. And Clayton is here. Big thank you to Clayton, as always. It's like, you know, if you're a teacher, guys, and the principal of the school comes in and sits down in the back of the room, that's Clayton right now. He's overseeing it. Well, I don't like that reference to the well, principal. It's good. I mean, the principal that we love. That's <laughs> the principal that we all like, not the one we didn't like, the one we like. No, I love just hearing the stories, guys. So thank you, yeah. coaches, for being here. And, um, you know, supporting. It's, uh, it, it means a lot to our whole team. It's our pleasure.
our pleasure. And as Casey said, and as, as Clayton just alluded to, I mean, these camps are so important for you guys to meet other kids and other people who are involved in, in, in this side of the sport. Um, and the, you just because you'll go home and there's no one really to talk to about wheelchair tennis. There's no one really to connect with. And so these camps are so very important to get you guys together.